And, and I want to talk about the Holy Spirit, a couple things about the Holy Spirit, just in a real simple way. I want to try to make it just as simple as I can make it so that we understand what it is that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. And, and I can't, no way in a little bit of time that we have can we go really deep into it. But I know that everybody here knows that he is a part of the Trinity. He is God. There is God the Father. There is God the Son. There is God the Holy Spirit. He is God. He is no less God than God the Father. He is no less God than Jesus is. He is God. But I think a lot of time he's relegated to down here somewhere. Uh, we always say he's the third person of the Trinity. There is no third person. They together are one. They are God. And the Holy Spirit is God. And I know that everybody here knows that, but we need to understand that. And we need to, to watch ourselves, how we think and what we say. Because I caught myself saying he's the third person of the Trinity. He's not the third person of the Trinity. There is one God. You all know the scripture, hear O Israel, the God our Lord is one God. He is one. They are one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. He is as much God as Christ and as God the Father. And as far as uh, his entering in and his coming to the believer, Jesus said when he was going back, he would send a comforter who is the Holy Spirit. And he would come and he would teach us. He would come and he would lead us. He would come and he would guide us. He will speak what Christ has spoken. He will tell us the same thing. He, he has exactly the same thought, the same speech, and, and wants to teach the same things that Christ did. He would come and he would indwell us. Christ was here and Christ was here physically and he was on the outside and he led and taught his disciples. Now when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes on the inside and leads and teaches from the inside out. Uh, Jesus gave his disciples power. He said, I give you power over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall anybody means hurt you. When he sent them out two by two, he told them to go out and to heal and to cast out devils and do all that. He gave them the power. He bestowed it on them. That same power that he gave to them is available now through the Holy Spirit when he moves in. It comes from the inside now though. Instead of Jesus bestowing it on you and sending you out, we are all now sent. We all know Christ said when he goes back, go ye. We are all sent. And we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be sent. And I've talked a lot about we need the filling of the Holy Spirit in order to have the power to go out and do the job that he would have for us to do. And I want to talk a little bit on those things and try to keep it really plain and really simple. And again, please understand, there's no way we can get into everything about the Holy Spirit. There's just a couple things God has put on my heart to make clear and to make plain. And I want to start with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people got it wrong, and a lot of people got it backwards, and they interchange the filling and the baptism. They are not the same thing. When you are baptized into the church. It is the Holy Spirit that does that. You are immersed into the body of Christ. We all know that when we get baptized, it's immersion in water. We are immersed in that water. We are surrounded by that water. And it's, that's what happens when you are born again. The Holy Spirit comes and he baptizes you into the church. He immerses you into the body of Christ. Listen to what he's saying here, for we are all one body. How can we be one body when we are separate individuals? We have to be brought together and linked up and unified and made to be one. We are immersed into the body of Christ. We become a part of it. That's the baptism of the Spirit. I've looked at this and I've prayed about this and I've read this. And every time that he talks about being baptized, you are brought into something. And that's what the baptism, listen again, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. We are brought into that body. That's the baptism of the spirit. That's what the Bible means. When the Bible talks about the baptism of the spirit, it is being brought into that. 
As the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And it's by that spirit that we are baptized into one body. We are all joined together. That's what the spirit does. When you are born again, it connects you, it links you, it makes you a part of the body of Christ. You're like one cell uh, in the human body. There's billions and billions and billions of cells. You are taken. You are a cell that is taken and placed into that body of Christ by the Holy Spirit at your conversion. At the moment that you are born again, you are baptized. You are immersed into Christ. You become a part of the body of Christ. Uh, that's pretty much all I want to say on that. We could go a lot deeper, but the time doesn't permit. But we need to understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit are two different things. Every born-again child of God receives the Holy Spirit. You cannot be born without the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes at that moment of conversion, He makes you a part of the body of Christ. He baptizes you into the body of Christ. And it helps me, I don't know if it helps you to picture it that way, like everybody is billions of cells. We are a cell in the body of Christ. We become a part of the body of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. I want to jump over to Ephesians and chapter 5. There is never a command given to be baptized in the Spirit. It's not in the Bible. It's just what happens at your conversion. It's what happens when you accept Christ. It's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and cleans you up. He brings you into the body of Christ. He makes you a part of it. It's not a commandment to be baptized. Now, if we have to be baptized in the Spirit, but go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a commandment. He said, if God tells you to do something, that's a commandment. And what he said here is, be filled with the Spirit. It's a choice. If you look at it in the context that he put it in, if you look at it how he laid it out here, first thing he says is, be not unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. God has a will for your life. As a child of God, He has a will. He has things that He expects you and wants you to fulfill. And He's telling us here, don't be unwise. I want you to understand what the will of God is for you. And that will is not to be drunk with wine, not to be influenced with wine. Everybody knows that alcohol has an influence. It causes you to do things. It, it, it removes inhibitions and makes you do all kind of stuff. But that's why he's using it. He said, don't be filled with wine. Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and, and get it the way he says it. He has a purpose. He has a reason. He wants you not to be unwise. In other words, he wants you to be wise. He wants you to understand what the will of God is. The will of God is that you would be filled with the Spirit. Not filled with anything else that's going to influence you. Not filled with anything else that's going to control you. Not filled with anything else that's going to make you do things. But filled with the Spirit of God which will control you. Which will influence you. Which will cause you to do things. And this is a command. The way he says it. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And again, I want to make this comparison. Nowhere does it say, be baptized in the Spirit. That's something that happens. Uh, we read it there. It happens at your conversion. It happens at the new birth. You are baptized into Christ. That's the baptism of the Spirit. This is the filling of the Spirit. Once you are filled with the Spirit, it changes you. Hey, I know that you are changed at your conversion, but this goes even further. Hey, it, it empowers you uh, with Comparing it to the wine, the wine has an effect, it has an influence, it has a, a degree of control over you when you take it to excess. And that's what he's saying, don't take that to excess, but get filled with the Spirit and let it have control. Let it have charge. And that's what I'm talking about when I preach these messages where I'm talking about that we have to be filled. And I always say that we got these preconceived ideas and these preconceived notions and all this kind of stuff that is going on. Uh, that we've heard over our life, 
we need to stop and read what the Bible says. To be baptized in the Spirit is one thing. To be filled with the Spirit is another. And you go on and read here. Once you are filled with the Spirit, what does it say? But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And it goes on and it talks, but all this stuff comes after you are filled with the Spirit. Nowhere here does it say, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues. Nowhere does it say be filled with the Spirit and roll on the floor. Nowhere does it say be filled with the Spirit and run up and down the aisles. That's not the purpose of the Spirit. Some of those things we talk about are gifts of the Spirit. And we have them confused. We've been hearing and we hear it, we hear it on TV, you hear different preachers, you hear all this stuff. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will speak with tongues. If you don't speak with tongues, you are not filled with the Spirit. That's not in the Word. That's not the Bible. And back it up to that because because that seems to be the biggest one. Everybody, I hear it all the time. When I lay hands on you and you are filled with the Spirit, it will be evidenced by speaking in tongues. The Bible does not say that. It happens to some people, but the Bible doesn't say it has to happen. Paul lists the gifts of God. In that list is the gift of tongues. Nowhere does Paul say everybody that's filled with the Spirit is going to speak in tongues. Paul says if God gives you the gift of tongues, you will speak in tongues. If God doesn't give you the gift of tongues and you're speaking in tongues, it's coming from somewhere else. It's either coming from you or it's coming from the adversary, one or the other. Nowhere does it say that. What the Spirit does, what the filling of the Spirit does, it brings you to a point where you have the power to do the things that God wants you to do. And it requires a power. But it requires uh, in the heart. How do you think those disciples who were scared to death and were hiding because they were afraid of the Romans and they were afraid of the Sanhedrin, they were afraid of the priests and, and, and all this stuff. How do you think they got the boldness to go out and stand in the middle of town and preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified? And not only preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, but to look the very ones in the eye that did it and said, you put Him to death. You put the Messiah to death. You put the Son of God to death. There was only one thing that gave them that power. We all know what happened on the day of Pentecost. They received power. Jesus told them that they would receive power. None of those places. You can't show me where Jesus said, uh, Terry, until the, the gift comes upon you and you shall receive power and you shall speak in tongues as evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's not in the Word. It's not in there. I know I focus a lot on tongues because that's what I hear every time I start talking about being filled with the Spirit. There are people that will tell you, well, if you're filled with the Spirit, you must speak in tongues. Or they're th on the opposite side of it, well, you're one of the crazy people that just wants to speak in tongues. It's got nothing to do with being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is to give you power. These other things are gifts. But being filled with the Spirit is a choice that God has told us that we should do it. But it is up to us. It's just like salvation. God won't drag you up here to the altar by the hair of your head and slam you down there and make you repent. He won't make you do anything. He offers things. He desires that we do things. He said here, I would that you would be wise and understand what the will of God is and go ahead and do it. He wants us to. He desires us to. It's for our benefit. It will empower us. And again, please understand, when I preach on these things, when God sends these messages, I'm not talking about power to go out here and stand and do amazing miracles. That may be a gift God gives you. And if he does, great, use it. But the power I'm talking about is the power to be a witness. The power to be a light. The power to be a testimony. These men of God, when they would get in the presence of people, they were so filled with the Spirit, people would know there was something about them. That was because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. When they spoke, there was power in the words. Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what is it to be filled with the Holy Spirit? 
It's just to remove more of your own will, more of yourself, more of your desires, more of the flesh. The more of that you can remove, the more room there is for the Spirit to work. That's what it is to be filled with the Spirit, to let God have all the space. A lot of us, we got a little corner and somewhere tucked back in here that we allow the Spirit to have. He wants it all. He wants every bit of it. And if we're willing to give every bit of it, He's willing to fill it up. But we don't want to let go of things. We don't want to turn things loose. We don't want to be crazy people. We don't want to be this. We don't want to do that. But until we're willing to do that, as has been said here often, until we're willing to be that sacrifice, as Paul said, to present yourselves a living sacrifice, sacrifice your wants, Sacrifice your desires. Sacrifice your will. That's what Christ did when he went to the cross. He sacrificed his will. He prayed in the garden. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that's where we have to get to. There are things we like. There are things we want. There are things we want to do. There are ways we like to be. God's saying, lay it all on the altar. Now, he may still let you have some of those things or do some of those things or be some of those things. He may or he may not. But if he decides that's not for you, then you've got to be willing to let go of it and let the Spirit replace that. And if we can do that, if we can really understand it, and if we can really get a hold of it, there is a power that comes with it. A power for service, a power for testimony, a power to present the word. There is a power that we have not tapped into. There is a power that the church lost long, 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 long ago when they started deciding what these things meant and what these things mean. And we need to get back to what the Bible says. And again, I don't have a lot of time, but if you really study the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if you really study what it is to be filled with the Spirit and understand what it is to be filled with the Spirit. It's got nothing to do with tongues. It's got nothing to do with any of the other gifts. It's about being empowered. There's a scripture and I can't even think of where it's at right now. It's the top of my head. But Jesus said, when a strong man arms keepeth his place, then his goods are secure. But when a stronger than he comes and binds him, he takes his stuff. That's my words. But you know what he was talking about? He was talking about Satan. Satan is a strong man, and he dwells in you, and he keeps you doing those things, and he keeps you thinking those things, and he keeps you wanting those things. But when a stronger than he comes, the Spirit of God comes and binds him, and he takes over, and now he's in control. And the things then that become important, and the things then that become valuable are the things of God. They come before everything else. And if we would all be really honest with ourselves, maybe in some areas of our life, the things of God does come first. But maybe in some areas of our life, what we want comes first. What we seek after comes first. How we want to be comes first. And we make excuses for ourselves. And we tell ourselves it's okay. We don't have any right to tell ourselves it's okay. That's up to God. And that can't happen unless we become that sacrifice and let God say what is okay and what's not okay and how we should be and how we should not be. God wants us to have that. I read it to you. He wants you to be wise. He wants you to understand that his desire is that you be filled with the Spirit. And so then, once you are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit becomes your influence. And again, I want to make this comparison because that's the way God made it. That drunk man, his influence is the alcohol. It controls what he does. It determines what he does. Somebody will get drunk and they'll go steal a car because of them to do that. Then they go home and beat their wife because they're drunk. If they weren't drunk, they might not do that because the alcohol influenced them to do that. God wants the Holy Spirit to have that kind of an influence in our life, that we would do the things of God that we normally don't have the, the courage or the boldness or the backbone or the knowledge or whatever it is that we don't have to do it, we can have with the filling of the Holy Spirit. We can have that if we are influenced by the Holy Spirit. But we can't be influenced by the Holy Spirit unless He's in control, unless He's indwelling us, unless He's filling us, unless He has every area. 
And again, God wants us to have that. I read it to you. He said to be wise and understand this is the will of God, that you be filled with the Spirit. And, you know, how do I get filled with the Spirit? Do I got to go through a ceremony? Do I got to do this? Do I got to do that? If you watch certain ones on TV, they got to touch you. They got to put their hands on you. That's not Bible either. You go when Peter went. When God called Peter, you all know where God lowered down the sheet and, and then sent him to the Gentiles. And when Peter went and was preaching to the Gentiles, it said, while Peter yet spake, the Holy Spirit fell on them. Peter didn't touch him. He didn't lay his hands on him. While he was preaching, the Spirit fell on them because they desired it. Because they wanted it. They wanted it so bad, they sent for Peter to come and to present that word to them. Nobody's got to put their hands on you. Nobody's got to do anything. Nobody can control the Spirit of God. These men and these people that think they're so all that that they can touch you and you're going to get the Holy Spirit are thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think. That's they right. might be giving That's you right. a spirit, but you better be careful what spirit you are getting. That's right. And I believe, I truly believe a lot of what is passing for the Holy Spirit is a very unholy spirit. God never told in that scripture where I read it, where he said to be filled with the spirit, he never told us, go to some man, have him put his hands on you and be ye filled with the spirit. He didn't say that. <laughs> he says, <clears throat> and you don't have to go, to, it's over Matthew chapter 4. You know where he's going through the, the Beatitudes, the blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are those who weep. You know what thing really jumped out of me? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. That's our problem. We ain't hungry. We need to get hungry for the things of God. We need to get hungry for the things of the Spirit. We need to get hungry to be the people that God intended for us to be. I know I've said this a lot. Is this all there is? Is this it? And please don't think this is blasphemous. But if this is all there is, he's not much of a God. This is the God who created the universe, who spoke everything into existence, who holds it all together by his word, who created life out of a pile of dirt who breathed life into a pile of dirt and it became a living soul. It became a human being. And the intelligence that he's put into people's minds, the way the body works and operates, all the deep, deep things of God. If he done all that, he must be an awesome, powerful, mighty God. And if he's an awful, powerful, mighty God, and we are his children, how can this be all there is to it? We gather on Sundays. We get a little bit happy once in a while. We shed a tear or two. Is that it? It can't be. Something went wrong somewhere. We need to get back to what the Bible says we are supposed to be. As children of God and as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to get back to what it was intended to be. And the only way we're ever going to get back to that is if we really desire it, if we really want it. Not because I want to speak in tongues and have people look at me and think I'm holy. Not because I want to run the aisle. Not because I want to shout. Not because I want to be happy. Not because I want goosebumps. But because it's the will of the Father. We should desire it. That was his will. That was his desire. I read it to you. And I'll probably keep repeating it. He would that you would be wise and understand what his will is. To be filled with the Spirit. That's his will. And until we understand that, and until we get to the point where we really want to please our Father, we're not going to get hungry enough to get it. If you were lost in the woods for a week and a half with nothing to eat, and you came upon a pack of Twinkies, you'd be ripping that thing. You might even eat the plastic because your hunger was such that you couldn't contain it. You would be in that just as quick as you could be in that. We should be that way about the things of God. We should have such a hunger for the things of God that we can't contain ourselves that we just jump on it. When God offers it, we'll just jump on it. But the example I gave, if you were lost for a week and a half and you were starving and somebody come up and offered you something to eat, they're not going to have to ask twice. You're going to snatch it out of their hand and you're going to gobble it up. Well, God has offered some things and we're not hungry. I don't know why we're not hungry because the church has been starving for a long, long time. I, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand. I'm guilty. 
I think the entire body of Christ is guilty. And I think a lot of it comes from misunderstanding. The Holy Spirit of God is nothing to be afraid of. The Holy Spirit of God is nothing to dread, nothing to fear. He is our comforter. With a name like the comforter, why would you be afraid? With a name like the comforter, why would you not want him in your life? Every bit of him. Not just enough to baptize you into the body of Christ. That's where most of the church has stopped. Everybody received the Spirit at their conversion. You were baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. And most of us stop there. That's where it starts. That's where it should begin. That's where we should begin to develop a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. And he said over there, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. If you hunger after the things of God, God will give you the things that you hunger after. He will give you the things that you thirst after. But we have yet to get hungry enough. And I've said this before. If you've got to pray for a desire, pray for a desire. If you've got to go to God and ask him to just get down inside of you and work and do whatever he needs you to do so that you understand, so that you comprehend, so that you get to that point where you have that hunger, then pray. God knows how you are. I said that a little bit earlier. He knows how we're made. He knows what our thoughts do to us. He knows what the influence of the world and the influence of Satan and the influence of the church has done to us. He understands that. But he can clean it up. He can remove it. If we will go to him with a desire to have it removed so that we can get to that point. I'm going to jump over to the book of Luke. Real familiar, and I, I think I even mentioned it this morning. Book of Luke, chapter, chapter 11, beginning at verse 5. Jesus speaking here. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto thee, Though he will not rise and give him because of his friend, Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. The word importunity just means persistence. Because of his persistence, because he didn't give up, because he didn't quit, because he showed he really wanted it, and he was going to keep knocking until he got it, he got it. He goes on and says, and I say to you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Now listen. He said to ask, seek, and knock. That's persistence. Don't just ask and quit. If you ask and don't get it, look for it. If you look for it and don't get it, knock on the door. If you knock on the door and you don't get it, ask again. Be persistent. I, I, I believe that God wants us to show that we mean business. That we are going to persist. That we are not going to quit until we get what it is that we are hungry for. Like that man, he kept knocking on the door because his friend was hungry. His friend needed something to eat. He wasn't going to give up until he got him something to eat. And because of his persistence, he got the bread. And then he goes on and he said, if you want something, you ask. You knock, you see, you ask, you knock, you see, you be persistent, you be persistent, you be persistent. You show God that you mean business and you ain't going to quit. And it comes back to what I said about prayer. We think we drop down here for 30 seconds. Oh, God, give me this and get up and go on our way. If I don't have it by tomorrow, God don't want me to have it. He said, ask. He said, knock. He said, seek. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't, unless God says, no, I ain't giving it to you, don't quit. Keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. That's not my idea. That's what the Word says. And we're going to go on. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? 
I've heard this scripture preached all kind of ways about getting your food and getting your house and getting your car and getting this and getting that. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Everything he's talking about here was leading up to set you an example to show you what is required in order to receive the Holy Spirit. And what is required in every instance, hunger. The man went and knocked on the door because his friend was hungry. He kept knocking on the door because his friend was hungry. He didn't quit because his friend was hungry. And because he didn't quit, he got the bread. And then Jesus goes on and says, I say unto you, ask, seek, knock. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't quit. Persist. 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 Because if your kid asks it for you for an egg or for some bread, or again, if your kid is hungry and they ask for that, you're going to give them that. It's all got to do with a hunger, an internal hunger, a desire that you cannot quench, a desire that needs something to satiate it, to satisfy it, to fill it, until we get to that point where we are that hungry, we're not going to get it. We need to go before God and fall on our faces and ask Him for that desire. We need to ask Him, God, I want to want it, but God, I don't know what's wrong with me. He'll tell you what's wrong with you. He will clean you up. He'll take out all the worldly ideas. He'll take out all your preconceived ideas. He'll take out the, the ideas of the false prophet and the false preacher and the false teacher. He'll take out all that stuff and let you see it for what it really is. We got our heads so full of stuff. We can't see the pure, simple, basic word of God. And it is exactly that. It is pure and it is simple. If we would just look at it for what it says. I've said this many, many times. God says what he means. He don't want to hide things from you. He's not trying to make it a riddle. He's not trying to make it something you've got to figure out before you know what to do. He puts it plain. Very plain. How much plainer can you get? He took it and he compared it to a hunger. And if you're hungry, you'll do whatever it takes to eat. That man's friend was hungry. He did whatever it took to get his friend something to eat. If your kids are hungry, you give them something to eat. How much more will your father give you something if you're hungry for it? But you got to be hungry for it. Hungry enough to persist, to seek, to knock, to ask. To forget all that other garbage that's going around out there. The other stuff that has filled up our hearts and our minds, that has come into our churches and adulterated the Word of God. That's exactly what it has done. It has taken the Word of God and tried to make it say something that it don't say. The majority of that stuff out there is a lie. A majority of it is foolishness. It's got just enough of the Word in it to fool people. Just enough of the Word in it to trick people. Satan uses Scripture. He used it on Christ. And he's using it on the church. And the church is buying it. The church is falling for it. We need to get back to the simplicity of the gospel. This is a simple thing. It really is. I know a lot of people think the Bible is hard to understand. When God wants his children to know something, he puts it plain and he puts it simple. There are some things that are hard. Some of the prophecy and some of the things that are going to come in the future. There are some hard things. But if God wants his children to know something, if it's something they need, if it's something that will benefit them, if it's something that will help them be a better witness, if it's something that, that will empower them for his service, he puts it plain and he puts it simple. And man comes along and messes it up. And we believe the man. That's what's going on. That's what has happened. And I wish we had more time that we could really get into all of this. But that's the simple basics and that's the simple facts. Whatever you're hearing out there, whatever you're tuned into or whatever you've been taught or led to believe, what I gave you was all Bible. Straight out of the word, what God said, what God had written down. To become a body, a part of the body of Christ, you must be baptized into it by the Spirit. You are baptized in the Spirit to become a part of the body. That's the baptism of the Spirit. That's the only baptism of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is allowing the Spirit to come in and take over, to take control, to be the influence in your life. Just like that drunk man, his influence is alcohol. That alcohol leads him to do certain things. 
We are to be influenced by the Spirit so that the Spirit is leading us to do certain things. That's the filling of the Spirit. But you can't have it until you get hungry for it. It's amazing to me the way that God used food. Something that we all can understand. He brought it down to that level so simple that even a child can understand. If you get hungry, your father will feed you. It's that plain. It's that simple. You being parents, if your kid is hungry, you're going to feed them. How much more will your heavenly father feed you if you get hungry? If you get hungry and you desire it, you will be filled. It may take some time. You may have to persist. You might have to ask. You might have to seek. You might have to knock. But he promised, if you don't give up, if you are persistent, if you show him you mean business, he said, you will be filled. All this stuff, and again, I know I already addressed it, but I need to say it again. All this stuff with tongues and all the other things, they're separate from the filling of the Spirit. They're totally another thing. They're another subject. They are the <coughs> gifts of the Spirit. When that Spirit moves in you and that Spirit fills you, He brings with Him a gift. Or more than one. It can be more than one. But He brings, and your gift may be tongues. Or it may not be. Everybody who gets filled with the Spirit doesn't get the gift of tongues. You may get another gift. You may get the gift of healing. You may get the, the gift of charity. You may get the gift of hospitality. You may get the gift of something else. I don't know. But everybody gets a gift that the Spirit brings to them. Speaking in tongues is not evidence that you are filled with the Spirit. And I dare say, if because some man laid a hand on you and you begin to babble, you better go check who it is that's making you babble. Because that's not the word. God may choose to do it that way, but I think if he chooses to do it that way, he's going to let both parties know. That's right. There's going to be no doubt. <clears throat> not because some guy with a big name and a big minister says that's how it has to be. There are people who want that so bad that they'll accept it regardless of the source. Not even questioning the source. Not even wondering about the source. They'll just accept it. The Bible tells us to try the spirits. To know whether they are of God or not. Many of the spirits in the church are not of God. Many of the spirits professing to be from God or from Satan. And it's bringing a lot of problems and a lot of confusion and a lot of division to the church. I don't know of too many other things that has caused as much division in the body of Christ as tongues or the filling of the Spirit or the baptism of the Spirit. And it ought not to be that way because the Word makes it plain. You know, it, it, and again, it, it just amazes me how plain it is and how it can be so misconstrued and changed and rearranged and, and, and taken to a whole other place other than what God intended for it to be. That's really all that I had. I, I think it's important that we get back to understanding things because the Word says so. Not because a man or a denomination or anybody else says so, but because the Word says so. And again, I'm just going to recap this. When you hear somebody talking about being baptized in the Spirit and speaking in tongues, that's not Bible. Because the baptism of the Spirit brings you into the body. That's what that does. That happens at conversion. And when they talk about being filled with the Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, that's not Bible. I've read you here where it talks about they want you to be filled with the Spirit, and then he goes on and says some things that will happen once you are. None of those are tongues. That's not Bible. And if we want to be empowered for service, and there are scriptures we could have went to, but you, probably, you guys probably know them. If you don't, you can go home and look them up. Where it talks about the power of the Spirit in the disciples. It talks about the power of the Spirit that led Paul. The power of the Spirit in those men of God. It gave them the power. 
to be the person, the witness that God wanted him to be. Stephen was stunned. He preached Christ and him crucified, knowing what the end result was going to be. Even as he lay there being stunned, he prayed for their forgiveness. That's the power of the Spirit. Within our own flesh, within our own selves, there's no way we can do that. We might think we're nice people and, and we're forgiving and we're this and we're that. But somebody's cracking you in the head with rocks to kill you. And your first thought ain't going to be, Father, forgive them. It's the power of the Spirit that enabled Stephen to do that. The power of the Spirit will enable you to do some amazing things for God. And I'm not saying he's going to make you go out here and get hit in the head with rocks. But if it can do that, what else can it do? It can embolden you, give you a backbone, give you the words, put power behind those words. It can make you, as Peter said in one place, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You can't do that without the power of the Spirit indwelling. So now you know what I mean when I talk about being filled with the Spirit. I mean what the Bible means. And I believe we need it because God said that's His will. He said, I want you to understand. I want you to be wise. I want you to know what the will of God is. That you be filled with the Spirit. And again, it's not going to happen until we get hungry enough. Until we really desire it and we really want it. And I'm going to say this again. Because God knows who we are. God knows how we are. He knows the little arguments we have with ourselves in our minds. He knows the questions we have in our minds. And, and all that stuff that goes on there. We can come to Him. And ask him for a clear mind. We can come to him and ask him to remove any other influence. And enable us just to see what it is that he wants us to know. He will do that for us. If we will come to him and seek that. There's nothing wrong with admitting to God that you have doubts. That you have questions. That you're unsure. Because he already knows it anyway. And it would please him if you would come. And, and bow before him and admit that to him. And ask for his help with it. And I think... Uh, we need to do those things so that we can get a clear mind. So that we can see the Word of God for what the Word of God says. And once we can do that, then we can develop that hunger for the things of God. Once we can see them plainly and clearly, we're going to begin to want them. You know, there have been times when I really wasn't feeling hungry. But I'd walk in and I'd smell steak cooking. I was hungry. Once I started catching that, that odor that would come in and... and my taste buds would start salivating and then I was hungry. Once we start getting really a clear picture and a good whiff of the things of God, we'll get hungry. We'll begin to develop an appetite. We'll begin to be hungry for the things of God. And once we are, then we can go to Him and do as Christ said. Ask for it. Knock on the door. Seek it. Keep coming back until you get it. Because he loves you more than you could love your own children. And if your own children are hungry for something, you're going to give it to them. How much more will he give it to you? That's it. I'll stop there.